Jesse, are you ready for rapid fire? Let's do it. All right. Here we go. Jordan Faison, of course, injured his ankle in the season opener against Texas A&M. He hasn't been 100% since. He, you know, he did play last week. Marcus Freeman discussed some of his other impacts on the game other than just receiving stats. The impact he made on that game to the people in the football program is tremendous, right? When you watch the plays that he was in, the way he blocked, um, some of the things he did, the routes he did run, just because he didn't get the ball, I mean, he was, I mean, he performed at an extremely high level, but didn't get the, the balls, didn't get the, 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 the stat line that really says to maybe the outsiders that um, it was a great performance, but man, he, he really performed really well. Um, he's healing, he's getting back to uh, the guy he was before he got injured, and we'll continue to find ways to try to get him the ball. Um, but again, sometimes those outcomes are a reflection of what the defense is doing and, hey, what decision is made at quarterback and those type of things. But you, know, you, ask, you talk about a guy that was asked to do this role and he couldn't accomplish it at a higher level than he did on Saturday. Had a really good run block grade in that game from PFF, 76.9 that he had. What do you need to see from Mr. Faison the rest of the way, Jess? I need to see a guy who continues to block well on the perimeter because uh, that's a huge part of Notre Dame. I mean, it's the biggest component of Notre Dame's offense right now, being able to run the ball, whether that's Love, Price, or Riley Leonard. And that means, you know, getting out on the perimeter, uh, especially when those running backs break those plays. So even when it's, you know, when it's a design inside run, but you see Love and Price do those jump cuts that they have, and all of a sudden it's hitting to the outside, well, Faison just – Faison doesn't know what's going on behind him. He just has to execute his block like, you know, the, the play could break loose, right? And so uh, that's kind of what I'm looking for in terms of the run game. And also a guy who can, you know, maybe stretch the defense out a little bit too on some sweeps or some perimeter runs or, you know, that that sort of action. And then as a route runner, you have to be able to utilize his speed to open up different areas of the field. So even like Marcus Friedman said, even if the ball isn't going to him, you still have to run precise, fast routes that clears or vacates a, the zone for someone else to kind of come in and fill in behind them, essentially, right? So I would love to see more phase on downfield, and I think that's naturally what's going to happen. But until that happens, he's not in, you know, over the middle of the field kind of wide receiver, right? He's he's a quick slant, bubble screen, tunnel screen, kind of jet sweep type of guy on the perimeter. But even when he's not doing those things, he can run fast, quick precise routes that allow the play to develop and open up for someone else. Yeah. And I mean, what stinks with that ankle is just the, like, it doesn't let him really use his full set of tools because yeah, of the cutting. Fact, yeah, exactly. Exa like it, it doesn't allow a low center of gravity guy with the kind of explosiveness that he has to be shifty. And you know, like you said, to be, you know, cut in that, that lateral type of stuff, it's really eliminated some of that, but, Hopefully with a bye week coming up, you know, they've already had the one bye week and it seemed like he was getting better, but then he tweaked it again. Hopefully that continues to heal up because all, all those things that you talked about, and especially the downfield stuff, like even if he's not able to be involved as an actual receiver as much, his ability to open up parts of the field with his speed to take guys with him to, you know, to have to be accounted for in addition to the blocking and stuff like that. But at the very least, you want that you you want him to be able to use his speed to open things up for other guys. At the very least, and that's yeah. kind of unfortunately sort of where he where he is right now. Yeah, you just need him to influence zones of the field. Sure, exactly, exactly. Okay, so a topic near and dear to your heart. Notre Dame has relied on sophomore linebackers Drake Bowen and Jaden Osbury, as well as fresh freshmen. Kingston Viliamu Asa a lot this year. Here's Freeman on that. I mean, one's a credit to recruiting. Did a good job of evaluating, recruiting really good players, but um, they're developing. Uh, they're they're becoming more comfortable. They have great God-given abilities, but Coach Bull is doing a great job of developing those skill sets uh, to really show up on Saturdays. Um, they're committed to it too. Like those guys are committed to it. So again, 
this game will require to make sure you're disciplined with your eyes, you understand your fit, then you got to use your God-given abilities. And uh, those three guys and, and some other young guys will, will make sure they'll do that. So what do you think about that, how those guys have played this year? I think that those guys have been great. And the, the how I define great for the linebackers is, you know, knowing kind of at the beginning of the season how inexperienced they were. Um, I feared at some point that they would become a hole in the defense or a liability in the defense. And I don't think that there's been a game where I felt like any of the linebackers have been a liability on defense. And I would argue that they're – their play has just gotten better and better every single game. Um, and I think this past game against Georgia Tech was kind of uh, the accumulation of that because I saw Drake Bowen just make beautiful open field tackles. And as soon as he got his hands on you, it was over, right? And so like Marcus Freeman said, it, it is the combination of basically, you know, your keys and your reads and then allowing your kind of physical – God-given abilities to finish off the plays. And I think the, the linebackers have done a great job about, you know, getting into the right spot. And, and again, that has to do with technique uh, and, and making the right reads and then finishing the play off with their speed, their athleticism, their strength. Um, and, and so that's what makes them so impressive is, again, I've never felt like any of them have been a liability on the defense no. uh, considering how inexperienced they were going into no. the season. That's exactly right. And I mean, this was one of the bigger concerns, I think, that, uh, you know, a lot of people had with the defense coming into this season was just the inexperience of the linebackers. But it has not been a thing at all this year. They they have they have played like veterans and, you know, like, all, you know, like the, the, the talk about Jalen Sneed and getting fewer snaps and all that stuff. Jade Nosberry and Drake Bowen have been two of the most consistent players on Notre Dame's defense across the board this year you know so like if you're looking at you know Osbury and Sneed playing the same position there's a reason Osbury is out there more <laughs> because he's playing better it's, it's hard when you got two studs at the same position yeah yeah but Osbury is playing better it it just comes down to that and you know KVA you know at, at times has been a little bit more up and down Ooh. but you know but overall his, his play has been really good for a true freshman as well. Yes. Just came to, a thought just came to me. Would not be surprised if you see KVA become the end man on the line of scrimmage at some point throughout this game, being the read man, uh, either crashing down on that dive or, you know, coming off of it and playing the quarterback essentially, right? Like we talked about um, Bryce Young, um, Josh Burnham, Junior Tui Alamaka. I think KVA is going to provide some critical depth, not only at linebacker, but I do think you'll see him also as the end man on the line of scrimmage. Like, remember that sack that he had against Louisville that came when he was the end man on the line of scrimmage. You want athleticism with that end man on the line of scrimmage, someone who's got enough quick twitch to, you know, explode on the dive, but also pop out and defend that quarterback um, in, in space. So I'm almost like positive now that I've, well, Maybe I'm biased because I thought of it, but I think <laughs> I think that KVA will will be playing. You know, he will he won't be predominantly that guy, but I I think you'll see some looks out of that defense where he's the end man on the line of scrimmage. Interesting. Okay, DK throwing uh, throwing a little at Vince. I know Vince with his declarative statements. All he thinks season. he's not playing. Where's he gonna play? Where's he gonna? No, the uh -huh. off season. Where's he going to play? He and Bowen play the same position. You know, it's, uh, it's, they might actually get out there at times at the same time. Oh, they play the same position. Okay, Vince. All right. Love you, man. But okay. That's all you got to do is just wait for Vince to make his declarative statement. And then, like, if you're a betting man, just bet the opposite. That's really what it comes down to, right? That's a solid betting strategy. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Notre Dame's special teams is blank. Is evolving. Uh, at the beginning of the season, I was I thought that they were their worst unit on the field at times. Um, and, and I think that they have naturally progressed week after week and gotten better. Uh, you know, they, they've caused havoc in, in the field goal game. I thought that they've been good uh, in terms of kind of their punt return and kick return. I think the only area where I'm still scratching my head and, and I, I know Marcus Freeman agrees with me too 
is, is this... what are they doing at punter? Yes. I like our I, I think that they just need to tell James Rendell, just cut it loose, dude. That's like, what qu- exactly quit quit telling him, quit micromanaging his technique and trying to get, you know, maybe this backspin or forward spin or just let him go out there and use that Thor leg and just nail it, right? Because I was listening to you and Trevor yesterday, and I agree with what Trevor said. At some point, Notre Dame is going to get into a dogfight where they got to pin teams within their own 20, 15, 10-yard line and play that field position battle. Um, and, and and it's like if you get to the 40-yard line or midfield and you're only flipping the field 20, 30 yards, it's just simply not good enough, right? And so they need – I don't know if he's got the yips or a mental block or too many people are telling him too many different things, but at some point I think you just need to tell him to rear back and kick that thing uh, and, and let it loose. Well, you know, and look, I feel like at this point, I agree with what you're saying about the punter. I don't, you know, we don't need to rehash that at all. But like when you look at this year's schedule so far, Texas A&M didn't play him last year. Northern Illinois didn't play him last year. Purdue didn't play him last year. Miami didn't play him last year. Louisville, repeat. Stanford played him at the end of the season. Georgia Tech didn't play him last year. Obviously, Navy is is an annual but you look at you know i mean that's that's what a notre dame schedule typically is because of notre dame's independence you see very few repeat opponents from one year to the next and i feel like as as you get into this middle part of the season i think it happened last year as well you know that's where marty biaggi because he has you know like he, you start to see some tendencies in the special teams, just like they felt like Georgia Tech was going to be aggressive coming, you know, going for the block last week. Like you start to see some tendencies pop up as you get into it when you, you know, because again, you didn't see those teams last year. And so I feel like we're starting to see some of the fruits of that show themselves with, with Marty Biagi and the special teams. Like he's able to, to actually hone in, find some specific things to look for, and he's he's able to start taking advantage of them now in this middle to later stretch of the season. Yeah, I'd agree, and I just think that you know they they've kind of come a long way. You know, kind of knowing that that Mason left and and Biagi was now kind of filling those shoes. But you also have to look at who's also playing those or filling those roles respectively on those units, right? Like Notre Dame had some really good guys who played well, you know, on punt return, kick return, punt block, field goal block, um, that sort of stuff. So I, I think it's a kind of an overall uh, – it, it's it's a good thing that we've seen them get better and not worse. Is it is it perfect? No. Is there things that need to be worked on? Yeah, but again, I don't feel like the special teams is something that's be, that is a liability or something that could influence a big game, right? Maybe could swing um, a, a big game, and and you know they had the muff the muff kickoff at, at or the fumbled kickoff at some point in the season. All that stuff is going to get cleaned up, and I think by the end of the season, when the games matter most, when when that stuff is taken care of, I think it'll it'll all be you know okay. And, and you know another thing I was kind of seeing in the chat as people kind of, you know, complain about kick returns and punt returns and stuff. I just think that stuff goes back to overall philosophy. Uh, I, I think Marcus Freeman would rather those guys just kind of get under the ball and fair catch it yep. in a lot of instances and just secure, secure them, get the ball back, right? Take no, the ball no at the 25. Yep. No need right. to fight for five more yards and potentially fumble uh, when you have an offense that's really, I, I think, you know, doing a good job about moving the ball and at least setting up their punter to, to flip that field position. Yeah. Going back to what we were talking about a second ago, it ain't rocket science, says the Freeman recruiting model is just now beginning to become a factor. Just wait until his recruits fill out the depth chart entirely to the three yeah. deep at every position. Yeah. I mean, that's that's exactly it. We're 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 seeing we're seeing the fruits of that on the defensive side. And I, I think especially next year, like we're seeing it in the running back room the most offensively, the the recruiting that that they've been able to do along with Dela McCullough, obviously. I think we'll we'll continue to see that more across the board when you do most likely have a homegrown quarterback back there playing next year. And hopefully some home, you know, some of these young, talented wide receivers as well. If I say 
you think what? Not good enough. <laughs> it's a D minus. Were, were you were you watching the game on Saturday? I was, but at some points I was toning out Theo or Lewis Riddick. They uh they harped on for Oh, that's their majority. chance to win if they go if they win. Sixty three percent chance to make the playoff. Yes. I just wanted to see if you were paying attention or not. <laughs> Again, when they brought it up for like the tenth time in the same quarter, it, it was like, can, "Can we just please talk about something else?" And again, is it is it is it coincidental that if the season ended today, Notre Dame would be the last team out by definition because of where they fall in the rankings? No, it, I just there there seems to be this underlying narrative that. ESPN and you know whoever an overall kind of body wants to push that well you're Notre Dame you did de- you decided this yourself you're not in a conference so you know it maybe a one loss will get you in maybe it won't but we're gonna probably do everything in our power to shaft you when it comes down to it at the end of the day right I'm I'm curious to see since this this week's game is on ABC you're gonna have Sean McDonough in there so it's going to be and McElroy. You know, right, but I mean, it's going to be a different crew, but that also means a different producer. And I, and I do think that's important, you know, because like everyone blames the announcers for all that, beating that, beating that drum, beating that dead horse for the entire game. But that starts with the, reading the, the, prompt. <laughs> the person in charge of the broadcast, which is the producer. That's right. So I'll be curious to see if whoever's producing this week's game takes a different angle or because you have – Six and one Notre Dame against six and zero Navy. If you get even more of that, you know, from basically both sides, you know, here's Navy's playoff chances. Here's Notre Dame's playoff chances. All that kind of stuff. And I think it's I I, I enjoy uh, McDonough and McElroy, uh broadcast. I think they are very good about, in my opinion, being neutral. Right? Like when I say neutral, I don't think that those guys have a side. But as you're going through the game, if I feel like that you are doing things to kind of take a side, then I don't think you're doing your job particularly well. And I think those guys do a good job about just kind of, you know, being on the fence and, and doing their job and just kind of pointing out the goods and bads for both teams, right? And and that's kind of objectively looking at things rather than kind of leaning or having, you know, some sort of underlying bias, in, in my opinion. I mean, McDonough's good, like, in in – in all honesty, like the guy was doing, the, you know, they they made him the Monday night football guy for a year or two before they took him out of there when they kind of realized oh, that he's he's more of a college guy than he is an NFL guy. But, I mean, he's been doing it forever. He's been doing it so long. I remember he came and talked to, you know, one of my broadcasting classes once when I was still in college. Like, that's how long Sean McDonough's been doing it. I, personally, I think he should be the number one guy for ABC slash ESPN, like the number one, you know, play-by-play guy because he's their best play-by-play announcer. I know there are some who, who like Joe Tess, and I like Joe Tess as well. But like, if I if I were, you know, picking who I I thought should be like, who's the best play-by-play announcer for college football, ABC slash ESPN, it would be Sean McDonough, hands down, bar none. So it's like you got a you got a really good crew doing the game this weekend. So this one came from Father David on the Champions Lounge the other day. He said, honest question, is Lincoln Riley gone before the Notre Dame game? He said they lost to Maryland to fall to three and four. They're one and four in the Big Ten, two starting defensive linemen redshirting this year. The record is worse than Clay Helton's at the same point. He's got a huge buyout, but Southern Cal can't believe he's the guy at this point. So what do you think is... Is uh, Lincoln Riley still the head man in L.A. when the Trojans play Notre Dame? Yes, uh, and, I, and I think he will He will be the head man in charge next season as well. Um, I, I think he is struggling, um, but this is, this is the, the fate that USC and kind of Lincoln Riley decided to take on. They wanted to go to the Big Ten. I think they knew there would be growing pains in moving the Big Ten. Um, and I, I think that, you know, Lincoln Riley, he is, and this is, you know, Lincoln Riley, Todd Helton, Lane Kiffin, like 
I think they're just kind of all the face of an athletic department that is more so the underlying problem when it comes to USC. So I don't know, you know, and, and it, it's, it's to me, it's kind of like the Cowboys until they structurally make changes to who's ultimately making the, the, the decisions at the top. I don't really see any reason that a new head coach is going to come in and magically, you know, change things. And I do think that Lincoln Riley, given his, offensive prowess, um, his ability to recruit high-end quarterbacks is ultimately what's best for USC. I, I just think that, you know, to be quite honest with you, the Big Ten's a different brand of football, and I don't think USC was ready for that physicality quite yet. And, and I think yeah. it's going to take a little bit of adjustment at the end of the day. And I mean, I mean, there's there's adjusting to the Big Ten and there's losing to Maryland. I mean, that does... <laughs> It does kind of, you know, fall to another level. I tend to think because of the buyout, he's got at least another year out there. But if they have another year next year, like they're having this year, I, you know, I, I, I would not be surprised, you know, but you know, let's, you know, like if, if you go back and retrace this whole thing, I mean, it's sort of like when, when Georgia tech, when, um, when, when they, had to trans, you know, kind of like transitioning from the Paul Johnson era into the modern football era when Paul Johnson retired a few years back. Remember Johnson, who was the Navy head coach in 2007 when they beat Notre Dame, he took his triple option offense to Georgia and they had to start recruiting to a different level, you know, to to, to like bring Georgia up to speed. And Brent Key has, has done a pretty good job since he took over when Jeff Collins was fired a couple of years ago. And I mean, the biggest thing for Lincoln Riley is they've got to start recruiting that thing better. Like you look at the, at the difference in the level of recruiting that Riley has done out there at USC versus what Marcus Freeman has done here. It's just a heck of a lot different. And they've, they've got to start getting some big 10 type bodies in that thing, in that program. So, uh, and you know, again, he went to USC because Oklahoma, you know, I don't think he ever said it out loud, but I mean, let's be honest, Oklahoma and Texas were headed to the SEC. They're in the SEC now. So he goes to USC thinking he's going to be coaching Pac-12 football. Well, not so fast because I, I think it only took one year, if it even took a year, before they made that announcement that USC was going to the Big Ten. So I think it's been a little bit of a shock to uh, to everybody's system, but I do think that Lincoln Riley is going to be there at the end of the season, I think he's got at least one more year before they make that kind of, but you know, they've gone through how many coaches now since Pete Carroll left for the NFL, but they've gone through a lot of athletic directors out there as well. It's just been an athletic program in a lot of turmoil. So I can't see them, you know, with, with the, with the shape that their athletic department is in, I can't see them, sinking themselves in that kind of debt and cutting loose of, of Lincoln Riley after just three years. That's what I mean. They've, they've just kind of made their bed. So it's, it's either they got to lay in it or <laughs> go out and make something of it. Right. Yep. That's exactly right. Anthony, thank you for that super chat. The whiteboard fee just for you, Jess, just for you. So fill in the blank. The currently most overrated teams in the top 25 are blank. I went with two. I don't know how many you have. This was tough. I don't really care about any of the teams beyond like 15. Um, so mine was kind of like a top 15 view. Um, I went Iowa State, Clemson, and Miami. <laughs> Coincidentally enough, all you teams. Clemson's are overrated. Really? Yeah. Who have they, after getting boat raced by Georgia, who have they beat? They've beaten. Well, I mean, like, they play in the ACC. Yeah, like, but it's Appalachian State, North Carolina State, Stanford, Florida State, Wake Forest, and Virginia. I mean, who? What? What game sticks out where you're like, man, that's a really solid win to kind of like, you know, sway me from the fact that they got absolutely boat raced by Georgia in, in that first game. I'm not sold on Club Nick yet. Um, I okay. think they're not as good. I mean, as that's fair because it is, it is pretty like they, and you know, my, they and Miami are obviously in the same conference. They haven't played each other yet. I feel like Miami is a little bit more overrated than Clemson personally, because at least you can say, well, Clemson played, you know, and that was, that was a tight game. That was like barely any score at halftime. And because Clemson's offense 
couldn't keep like I still feel like Clemson has a pretty good defense, I guess. That's what I'm saying. I agree with like not being completely sold on Klubnik, but I, I at least feel like they've got a legitimate defense. Yeah, and then Go you ahead. then you look at Miami and it's like, okay, they've beaten Florida. They stink this year. Beat Florida A and M. Who are they? Beat Ball State, uh, South Florida, Virginia Tech, Cal, and Louisville. And that Louisville game was just a matter of who was going to have the ball last and score essentially because none of those teams could stop each other, right? So Miami's biggest win is Louisville, and you should you can argue that they probably should have lost that Cal game. You know that they came back and scored like twenty some points in the fourth quarter on the road to win. I went to bed and literally woke up in the morning in disbelief that that they came back and won that game against Cal. But again, they haven't, they haven't really played anyone. Right. And so, you know, everyone makes, and and this is where I'll kind of wrap up this point is everyone makes fun of Notre Dame for, for losing to NIU, but what have they done outside of that? They've beaten a good Texas A&M team. They beat Louisville, who is now that they've kind of sent into a spiral you know, backwards at the time they, that Louisville was a ranked team, right? And, and then these other games, Stanford, Purdue, Miami of Ohio, they've blown them out. They haven't been relatively close games. And so I think Notre Dame has better quality wins. And then in, 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 in some of those but the other problem games, is they've got a bad loss. I mean, that's, yeah, but, that's why they're going to be knocked because, you know, one, one, it's a loss and two, it's a bad loss. There, there's just no way you can get around that because I agree with what, Jeff is saying Iowa State and BYU, they've played nobody except for BYU. At least they beat Kansas State. State. Iowa State's going to play Kansas State the last game of the regular season. You know, like how great is Kansas State? I don't know. That conference is generally not that good, but Kansas State, excuse me, is at least decent. So at least BYU has played them. And like Iowa State and Miami. Like, yeah, they've had to come. Like, Iowa State should have lost to UCF last week. But you know what? They came back and won. Miami should have lost a couple of times. But at the end of the day, they came back and won. And, like, that's – while I agree that Iowa State and BYU are over – you know, like, if you're you're comparing them to Notre Dame, that's right. They found a way to win, and Notre Dame didn't, you know? Like, that's what's separating them right now. Because if Notre Dame had won, they'd probably be – at least in the top six right now. Well, didn't, when they lost, weren't they top five already? Right? Like, I don't like. I think they were actually. I think they were number five. Yeah. So they might so even be. Yeah. They would probably be, in all honesty, like three or four right now with, you know, uh, Ohio State losing, Georgia mm-hmm. losing, Texas losing, Alabama losing. Like, you could make the case that Notre Dame could be sitting at number two right now had they not lost to NIU. So, you know, yeah. Are there teams ahead of Notre Dame that I, that I think aren't deserving? Yeah, but that's why we got, you know, seven or five games left on the schedule. Um, Navy and Army being undefeated really helps out Notre Dame. You know, whether or not they're a quality opponent on the field and they're playing them, the still some other while they'll go and have, you know, a really good season um, in, in, in terms of, you know, where they usually are. So Notre Dame has plenty of opportunities ahead of them. Um, I think Texas A&M, if they can continue to be good and, you know, potentially beat LSU this weekend, you know, as a Notre Dame fan, we want Texas A&M to go to win the, the rest of their games and their only loss to be Notre Dame. So, you know, I, I think there's still a lot to, to kind of unravel, but as long as Notre Dame does what they're supposed to and wins the rest of the games, they'll have a spot in the playoff and it won't really matter at that point anymore, kind of, you know, who's overrated. Yeah, I mean – Somebody made the comment about LSU earlier, and they've done what they've done. You know, Brian Kelly, third year in a row, lose the season opener and then rattle off a bunch of wins. And someone was talking about LSU is overrated. but They they do still have a win over an Ole Miss team that was top 10 at the time a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I'm cool with what LSU is I mean, you got to give them that. And, you know, and look, LSU, Texas A&M this weekend. We'll find out. We're, we're, we're going to find out here pretty quick. I tend to think Texas A&M might be at least a little bit better than LSU right now, but we're going to find what's out. Your, uh, what's your gauge on IU at 7-0? and and, and I want you to comment on that knowing, not knowing that their quarterback is hurt, you know, because that's I a big was, factor going forward. 
I was not a believer going into last week. I picked Nebraska to beat Indiana last week. And so much for that. I mean, I think Indiana is going to be really hard to pick against. And, you know, look, Signetti, man, you know what he's, he, he went out and we've talked about relying on the transfer portal too much, but he had to overhaul that roster and he went out, he went to the transfer portal. He brought a Mac quarterback in there and he beat out the other guy who was already in the program, you know, so he's had a Mac quarterback running that thing all year and they just look a little bit better every week. Every so, week. I mean, I, I want to not believe because they're Indiana, but they just keep getting it done and they're going to, you know, I think they play Ohio state at the end of the season. Let me check this here real quick on, on, where they are, you know, I know they play Michigan coming up here in a they couple of weeks. So, so they've got Washington this week, Michigan State, Michigan, Ohio State. They finish with Purdue. I mean, I don't see them beating Ohio State. Michigan game is going to be really interesting, even though like Michigan is looking worse all the time. They nice stink. Like th- I mean, this is this is the stretch where we're going to find out here coming up. You've you've got your backup quarterback playing against Washington this week. And then at Michigan State, against Michigan, at Ohio State. We're going to find – I don't see them getting through that unscathed, but they proved me wrong so far. I will be absolutely – if they can beat Michigan and Ohio State back-to-back, more so the Ohio State game, if they can beat Ohio State year made, put IU in the playoff, baby. (laughs) I just – I can't – I am so fed up with Ohio State fans and just them thinking they they know everything about college football and college football revolves around Ohio. It's just – it's so nauseating being in this state and and having to – everyone loves Ohio State in this state. That's the one thing you can all agree on is everyone loves Ohio State. DJ says Kansas State is going to win the Big 12. I mean, like I I tend to think that they are the best – team but BYU did beat them what's really going to be interesting is Iowa State and Kansas State will play at the end of the season that is most likely going to be the game to determine who plays BYU in the championship game of the Big 12 because BYU has UCF Utah Kansas Arizona State Houston they should run the table there and it's going to come down to Iowa State or Kansas State to play BYU in the championship game. I still think Colorado has a good shot at running the table. They only got one loss, and their remaining schedule is Cincinnati, Texas Tech, Utah, Kansas, um, and Oklahoma State. I'm just – I'm really curious to see how But that they've already well. lost to Kansas State, right? Right. So in a tiebreaker, they'd be probably – Right. So screwed. if Kansas State runs the table, which would be the win over Iowa State, then Kansas State would get in on the tiebreaker. But – yeah, I mean, Colorado just quietly somehow out there winning games. DK, thanks for that super chat. Jesse put the pressure on him <laughs> just because he feels bad for Cowboys fans. Okay, I'm sure you do. USMA87 wants to know if we're going to talk officiating in the Georgia-Texas game. We did nope. that a little bit yesterday. I don't know if you were here, USA. You know, we did that in, you know, we like not big. You know, we talked about the specific play, about the fact that, there's no way they should have gone back and overturned that pass interference. Like they ended up getting the call right, but the way they went about getting there, they shouldn't have been able to do that because the only reason they were able to do that was because the fans threw the trash on the field leading to the delay, which gave them more time to go back and uh, ultimately correct it. It's just, I don't know. Other than that, Do you have any thoughts one way or the other, Jess? Uh, I didn't get to watch any of that game. So okay. anything I say is irrelevant. <laughs> All, right. All right. Fill in the blank. A Yankees Dodgers World Series is blank. It's a battle of the beasts at the end of the day. And I, I see a lot of people, you know, oh, boo hoo, and oh, the top <laughs> teams in the cap got to the World Series. When does that ever happen? You know, like, I'm just so I being I I love Guardian baseball. I love being able to go watch baseball and, and be a part of 
know, those games. But I'm so nauseated about their fans scapegoat being, well, oh, of course the Yankees are supposed to win. They have a bigger payroll and blah, blah, blah. And it's okay. That's fine. But uh, you have an owner that has just as, the same amount of money as the, as the Yankees owner, but he doesn't want to spend that kind of money, right? And so I think so many of these fans get caught up in, in, in money, payroll, cap space, and there needs to be a, a, a cap limit and all this stuff. And it's like, well, why don't you look to see who's running the organization and how much they really care about baseball? Because the Yankees owner, he's all in. Everything he does is about Always have been. Know, rolling back into the Yankees, right? And so I personally don't care. You got Aaron Judge, Juan Soto, uh, John Carlos Stanton, Shohei Otani, Freddie Freeman, Mookie Betts. Like we're that's an All Star team right there. I don't care because I'm watching some of the best teams and the best players in baseball, and they just happen to play for the Yankees and the Dodgers, right? So I'm really excited for it. And again, I think it's uh, a, a battle of just two beasts right now. Two two teams on on their respective sides. Who you know, I didn't think the Yankees would be the team from the AL at the beginning of the season. Um, I thought the Dodgers had the best chance, but I thought that they'd do something to shoot themselves in the foot. I thought the Phillies were the better team, you know, down the stretch, but you know, they somehow got taken out, taken out by Mets. The, got hot at the right time. Yeah, they got taken out by the Mets, and you know, that's what that's what baseball is at the end of the day. So, uh, long story short, I'm really excited about this World Series, and I'm tired of hearing about all these. People boohooing about, well, they should be in the World Series because they have the highest payroll. Yeah, I mean, this is this is it right here. Fox love it. Major League Baseball loves it. It's market one, market two. Dodgers, Yankees, two of the you know oldest remain you know classic teams in baseball. They haven't played in a World Series since 1981. Fernando Mania, baby. It, it, Anybody out there remember Fernando <laughs> Mania, Fernando Valenzuela? That was the last time the Dodgers and Yankees played in the World Series, and they had some classic World Series prior to that as well, the Reggie Jackson three-home run game and, you know, all that. So, like, they used to play each other for championships uh, a lot more often, but it's been 43 years since it happened. So, you know, Major League Baseball loves it. And you've got some of the biggest stars in the game. I'm I'm going to be curious to see what the viewership for this thing actually ends up being because of the fact that you do have Otani and Betts and Judge and Stanton and, and these guys and, you know, Garrett Cole even, you know, on, on the other side with the Yankees. So let me see. I, I feel like the Dodgers are the better team. and I feel like the Yankees are much Ooh. less tested than the Dodgers, but crazier things have happened. I guess we'll find out. Let me see. Oh, man, I couldn't find it. So I know I can remember this one for certain. Back at the beginning of the season, college football flexed Rutgers and USC to this Friday night. Same day as game one between the Dodgers Ooh. and the Yankees. Isn't that kind of crazy how you got two New it York is. markets playing in L.A. on the same day? It's like if you're Fox – and your college football, you hit that thing absolutely out of the park by flexing that game. Like it is, and then I also saw that like there's like there's like three concerts that night in LA. Like basically every venue Friday night in LA is going it's to gonna be, be full. For. <laughs> yes, and so wow. if you live in LA and you're going to any of those events, I'm praying for you because it is going to be madness that entire day. Oh, World Series, baby! It's coming! It's coming! I'm excited. I, did, I forgot that it was Friday, that it started Friday night. I was thinking Thursday for some reason. There's a lot of a lot of questionable sports scheduling, I think. All right, great whiteboard earlier tonight, Jess. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up with that. Hit that like button, if you would, before you leave. And, of course, we'll be back tomorrow. We'll be back Thursday as well with more Ivy Nation sports talk i'm just gonna give myself a pat on the back for adjusting to my computer failures you would never know you made it through the rain baby we'll talk to you tomorrow